Dahlgren by Samuel R. Delaney, published in 1975, is the best book I've ever read. Dahlgren is lyrical, profound, trenchant, challenging, complex, satisfyingly contumacious, insightful, dizzying, mesmerizing, unputdownable, and for the right reader, will absolutely take your breath away. Knowing that this novel exists simply moves me. Dahlgren is a tremendous literary accomplishment, and it's like nothing else that you've read before, and you'll probably never read anything like it again. I recommend Dahlgren to the patient reader willing to study or discover with an open mind, an unusual and not completely knowable setting, and flexible enough to meet distinct and complex characters at their level. This review is for everybody. It would be very difficult to spoil the read, so if you haven't read this, stick around. And if you had read it, also stick around and let me know in the comments afterwards what you thought about it. If you love this book, absolutely talk my ear off in the comments about why you loved it and get carried away with me all about it. Martha and the Vendellas tribute parody music will follow the review. I don't possess the literary pedigree to assess deeply all of the messaging and inspirations attached to the work or suggest what the author's trying to say, and I'll therefore stay in the lane of relating my experience with this masterpiece. Arriving in the city of Bologna, the book's narrator does not know his name. For the rest of the story, we will know him only as Kid or the Kid. It's clear from the onset that his name and his sandal are not the only things that he's missing. He walks around in one sandal and one foot bare in this mysterious Midwestern city that has clearly been impacted by a catastrophic event. Also missing is Kid's sense of self-awareness and purpose, and maybe even, he wonders, his mind. At about the same pace that he discovers some of the character of the city, he likewise brushes up against a sense of his own character, and maybe some of the meaning that he's searching for is revealed. The fictional city of Bologna is responsible for the science fiction tag. You'll never discover what cataclysmic event occurred to transform the city into the mysterious place that it's become. Most notable is the presence at time of two moons in the sky, or even a giant red sun that scares the bejesus out of almost everybody. There are also some cyberpunk vibes as the local gang, the Scorpions, wear high-tech holographic shields in the shape of a variety of animals like scorpions, mantis, peacocks, and others. You can even read into the town subtle and not-so-subtle clues around possible manipulation or alteration of time and or space. This will be familiar to those of you who've read Delaney's novella, Empire Star. There are characters introduced throughout the novel who just might be, and there are clues to suggest this, a character that we've already met at a different point in their life. More prominent is Kid's evolution as a poet. Kid finds a notebook half-filled and jots down thoughts and verses. We absolutely are meant to consider if the poetry already present in the discovered notebook was written by Kid at another time. We absolutely will never know the answer to this. The notebook is significant as some of its contents are eventually published as a collection of poems, making the Kid a local hero of sorts. The notebook also serves as a resource for Kid to experiment with and examine language, consider the limits of language, and as a means to record events that he fears he might forget. Towards the end of Dahlgren, we get a look at what's written in the notebook and are ourselves challenged to consider what is real and what is imagined. To call the novel barely science fiction does do some disservice, I believe, as these elements all work perfectly to create an atmosphere and mood perfectly suited to host the story of Kid's time in Bologna and expose those he connects with. Delaney brilliantly sets us up to relate or to connect with Kid and discover much of the city as Kid does and drives us to ask ourselves some of the same questions, including... Can I exist in this world? Could I survive? Could I adapt? Could I thrive? And what is existence? Delaney takes us to the edge and compels us to ask, should I be a little bit afraid of becoming crazy? Or how far away from it am I? So much of the momentum of the read is that it raises endless questions. What do you see when you look at yourself in the mirror? Is the way I live, you live, we live civilized? What is reality? Much is made of Dahlgren being a difficult read. While I understand that, I suggest confronting it with an open mind. This isn't a, the science is overwhelming, difficult read. I believe the challenge will hit hardest those expecting a straightforward plot, suspense, climax, and a falling action. This is very much a slice of life book, a book about found family found in not the most obvious of places, and a book about survival. There also exists a temporal confusion as events as read, are either occurring or have already occurred. Try this on for size. The last line of the book is the beginning of a sentence. The end of that sentence, to wound the autumnal city, is the first line of the book. The most surprising thing about the storytelling is how fast and unputdownable it is. I've been given the privilege to witness kids' connections with Nightmare, Dragon Lady, Pepper, Baby, 
13, Copperhead, Dollar, and the rest of the Scorpions in the Nest. Despite the large cast and regardless of how much time we spend with any of them, each is a compelling and distinct character. So are those who can't fully commit to the Bologna experience, like poet Ernest Newboy and Kampf, the astronaut. There's also Miss Richards, the socialite, George Harrison, the accused rapist, for whom one of the city's two moons is named after, and Roger Calkins, the pseudo-governor of the city, Delaney offers just enough to make these characters real, while leaving enough unspoken for us to paint the rest of the picture. He also has much to say about racial identity, sexuality, sexual fetish, sexual freedom, privilege, and violence, providing the reader with much to think about. Delaney presents graphic, extreme, guilt-free, and elaborate sex, violence, and taboo relationships. While the reader is free to clutch their pearls and jerk a knee in response to the prolific sex capades, to do so would just really miss the point. What happens if you avoid the impulse to observe sexuality through the traditional societal lens? For one, you likely won't be robbed of the profound opportunity to access and engage with the counterculture and characters in a manner that no other author will offer you. The sex in the novel will challenge delicate sensibilities. It will examine power dynamics, gender roles, while mostly avoiding the interference of stigma or questions of morality. Again, it's impossible to read this book without thinking about how we look at sexuality the way society tells us to, and comparing it to what we feel while witnessing the behavior, impulses, emotions, unconscious instincts, and second thoughts of characters who we know and who don't know that we're watching them. In a sense, Bologna represents freedom. People come here for the most part, they abandon their old selves and they start over. It doesn't matter if they've done anything impressive. Nobody needs money, there's no economy, there's nothing really to buy, and anything that you need you can probably find by sharing or scavenging. There's enough food to eat and coffee to drink even if you can't always find a clean plate. There's a great line from one of the characters, Tack, who wants to be as lonely as the acquisition of all those objects would make them? Tack also suggests an intriguing way to distinguish people in the city, those who want and need much, and those who don't seem to want or need much. You can pretty easily find any kind of sex without any consequences. There appears to be no law and order other than an accepted unspoken code of conduct that if you follow, you're probably okay and you can be left alone to pursue whatever you wish to. This sense of control is mostly enforced by the local gang, the Scorpions. The Scorpions are sometimes violent. They go on runs and lift food or merchandise from mostly abandoned and sometimes not abandoned stores. More often they hang around their nest, which could be any number of abandoned homes or apartment buildings. And most instances of violence occur among each other. Did I mention they also have lots and lots of sex? There's also those who don't seem to know how to be free and either continue to live in a perpetual state of denial, like Miss Richards, incapable of responding to traumatic events, or Bologna Times newspaper publisher, the eccentric and controlling Roger Calkins, who looks to meditation and spirituality to make sense of the unpredictability of the world around him. Normally I do five likes and five dislikes at this point, but I don't have five dislikes and I really feel like an idiot even trying to come up with them. So let me just see where this ends up. Like number one, the scene at the elevator shaft and Dragon Lady. She's a scene stealer right off the bat and Delaney in this one scene demonstrates his ability to, in very few words, explore sexuality, death, denial, depravity, self-discovery, and terror. I'll direct you to pages 233 and 234 in the vintage edition if you want to look at that. Like number two, everyone has so much personality. You never know who's going to stop by the nest. Oh look, it's Ta-Ta-Ta Bunny, old Bun Buns. Awesome, we haven't seen her in a while. What's Denny going to wear to the party? Oh, he's going to bring all three of his shirts. I want to know every one of these people. Obviously, Kid, Nightmare, Lanya, and Tack. I'll take my chances with Dollar and Pepper. I won't be ashamed to be seen with Baby. I even want to have dinner, a brief dinner, with the Richards, and of course, Dragon Lady. I want to spend time with them. Like number three, sticking with characters, Delaney has the ability to make you think there's so much more to a character, even when he barely mentions them. Introducing Nightmare ever so briefly, you already know that there are levels upon levels to this somewhat minor character. You can go down the list of scorpions and you can say the same thing about all of them. Like number four, the scorpion runs. Do they really need to do this? They go on runs because it's just something to do. If they didn't, what's the point of this group of people finding each other and being with each other? I think the point is that they don't really have to do this, but maybe it offers some sense of stability among the otherwise unpredictable events that are happening around them. Like number five, kid leading the crowd of scorpions when the large sun appears, it's cinematic. Like number six, 
I'll give you a page number here. This is on page 640 on the 2001 Vintage Edition. It's already trippy on Riri because Kid's talking to Bill, and we know later in the book that this is likely Bill Dahlgren, thus also contributing to the temporal mysteries. But what I really love is Kid's exchange. I'm gonna read just a little bit of this. Bill being perhaps a bit condescending. Want to ask you, how would you sum up what you're trying to say in your poems? Kid leaned his elbows on his knees. How the hell am I supposed to do that? Sum up what I'm trying to say? I guess you'd rather we just read- Shit. I don't care if you read them or not. I just meant that- I'm trying to- Kid looked up at Bill, frowning in the pause. To construct a complicitous illusion in lingual catalysis. A crystalline and conscientious alkahest. Again? Bill asked. You listen to that too carefully and you'll figure out what it means. Kid let the frown reverse into a grin. Then the words will die on you, and you won't understand anymore. Bill laughed. Well, do you feel that your work accomplishes whatever you set out to do? Dislike number one, the critics. This is mostly tongue-in-cheek, but I have to at least try to have a dislike here. I feel like condemning the significant voices like Harlan Ellison and Philip K. Dick who have panned this work. For me, neither of these authors, especially Ellison, are capable of approaching this level of writing, and I found their criticism to be without merit. Likewise, I greatly appreciate the company of Dahlgren fandom, including SF Titans, Theodore Sturgeon, and William Gibson. Bonus like, when Kid suggests his name is Michael, it blew my mind. It was the last thread that I needed to connect me so tightly to this guy. The only thing that you can trust as a reader is your own interpretation of events, sexual or otherwise, and your own answers or considerations of all of the questions posed. Seeing my name associated with this character made this personal in a way that I can't even explain. Nothing in Dahlgren is certain, and like William Gibson mentions in his foreword to the novel, it is not there to be finally understood, and its riddle was never meant to be solved. One thing is for certain, you'll never forget how this book made you feel, and you'll never forget the book's opening line, to wound the autumnal city. Thank you for watching. I'm Michael Leverts, and this is fit to be read.